Welcome back to the deep dive. You know, whether you're building software, writing a book, or heck, even just planning a complex project, this idea of version control, it's kind of everywhere in modern work, isn't it? Even if you don't realize it. It's all about managing changes, working together, and uh, having that safety net. And right at the heart of it for so many people is Git. Okay, let's unpack this. Today, we're doing a deep dive into common Git use cases. We're basing this on a really comprehensive resource from Walid Musa called Plus 50 Git Use Cases, Challenges, Chalice. And our mission really is to give you a shortcut, a way to understand the essential Git commands and crucially when to use them, hopefully turning some of that confusion into, well, confidence. Yeah, and what's fascinating here is People often still think Git is, you know, just for coders, yeah. for software developers. But really, it's such a powerful tool for anyone collaborating on files, anyone managing different versions, or maybe just wanting a really robust safety net for their work. Oh, absolutely. Imagine never really losing an old version of a document or being able to rewind a presentation or uh, manage drafts of a big research paper. That's the kind of power we're talking about. It goes way beyond just code. Couldn't agree more. It really is a game changer for pretty much any digital work. So, okay, let's start with the absolute basics. You're starting a new project, or maybe more commonly, you're joining one that already uses Git. What's the very, very first step? How do you get that project onto your own computer? Right, that's usually Git clone. You use the command Git clone, followed by the repository's URL. It basically reaches out to where the project lives, the remote server, and pulls down a full copy. And importantly, not just the current files. Ah, the whole history, too. Exactly. The entire history comes with it. Every change ever recorded. Plus, it automatically sets up that link, that connection, between your local copy and the remote original. So sending and receiving updates later is straightforward. It's really the first step to jump into a Git project. Okay, cloned. Got the project locally. Now you start making your own changes. Adding things, fixing typos, whatever it is. How do you tell Git about these edits? How do you make them part of the project's history? Okay, so this is usually a two-step dance. Git add and then Git commit. Mm -hmm. After you change some files, you first use Git add. You can do Git add specific for all name or very commonly Git add .no yeah. to add everything that's changed. Think of Git add as, well, staging your changes. You're basically putting them in a holding area saying, okay, these are the specific changes I want to save in the next snapshot. Right, like packing a box. You gather up just the items you want to ship in this particular package. We'll say that. And then once you've staged them, packed the box. Mm -hmm. How do you seal it up and create that permanent historical record? That's git commit. Once your changes are staged, you run git commit m followed by a message in quotes like git commit m fix typo in introduction. This takes everything in that staging area and locks in as a prominent snapshot in the project's history. Mm -hmm. Each commit gets its own unique code, its hash, and crucially, that commit message. Mm -hmm. And that message should clearly explain what you changed and ideally why. You know, this raises an important question. How do you even manage a big project or debug things later without good commit messages? They're absolutely vital. They tell the story of the project. That's such a good point. It's not just for Git, it's for your future self, your team, anyone trying to understand what happened. Okay, so changes are committed locally, safe on your machine, but they're not shared yet, right? How do you send them up to that central shared remote repository? For that, you use git push. Simple as that, usually. Yeah. This command takes your local IDIC, commits those snapshots you just created, and uploads them to the shared remote repository. It's how you publish your work so others can see it and pull it down. Got it push to share. And the opposite, how do you get the latest work from others? You need to keep your local version synced up, especially when collaborating. Absolutely. To get the latest changes from the remote repository down into your local one, you use git pull. This command actually does two things. Right. It fetches the new commits from the remote, and then it tries to automatically merge those changes into the branch you're currently working on locally. It's the main way you stay up to date. Okay. Pull for updates, push to share, course stuff. Makes sense. But before you do any of that, or really any time, you often just need to know what's the state of things? What have I changed? What's staged? What branch am I on? Yes, that's fundamental. And for that, it's just git status. You type that and git gives you a quick summary. It tells you which files are modified but not staged, which are staged and ready to commit any new files git doesn't know about yet. And the branch you're on. Exactly. It's like your project's dashboard. Instant status check. And here's a quick little time saver, a pro tip related to what we just discussed. If you've only changed files that Git already tracks and you want to stage and commit them in one go. Ah, yeah, the shortcut. 
You can use git commit in your commit message. That a flag tells git to automatically stage all the tracked files you've modified. Right, only tracked files, not brand new ones. Correct, it won't stage new untracked files. But for quick updates to existing stuff, it combines the add and commit steps, which can speed things up. Okay, now, collaboration. <laughs> This is where Git, I think, really starts to show its power. Multiple people working on the same thing without, you know, constantly stepping on each other's toes. And that brings us to branches. Branches are absolutely central to Git's workflow, especially for teams. Think of them as, like, independent lines of development. Parallel universes for your project. Instead of everyone just piling changes onto the main project line, you create a separate branch, maybe for a new feature, or to try an experiment, or fix a bug. You work there in isolation. So you don't mess up the main stable version while you're working. Exactly. It allows for parallel work. Multiple people can build different things simultaneously without interfering with each other. And you know, if we connect this to the bigger picture, branches really enable innovation. They give you a safe space to try things out. They isolate unfinished work, reducing risk. It just leads to a much more organized process. Makes total sense. Yeah. So how do you actually create one and maybe jump right into it to start working? The quickest way is Git. Check out dep task B, new branch name. Yeah. The devs you plug tells Git, hey, create this new branch, and then check out immediately switches you over to it. Ah, dash B for both create and switch. Yep. If you just wanted to create it but not switch yet, you'd use Git branch, new branch name. And you could even get fancy and create a branch starting from an older commit, which is super useful sometimes. Okay, so you've got branches. Now you need to move between them. Switch tasks. Maybe review someone else's branch. Right. To switch... It's generally git checkout branch name. That command updates all the files in your working directory to match the state of that branch you're checking out. And it's worth remembering, checkout isn't just for branches. It can also be used to discard changes in specific files, like we'll mention later. Oh, in a handy shortcut, git checkout just a hyphen switches you back to the previous branch you were on. Oh, that's useful. Checkout brancher. Okay. So you've done your work on your future branch. It's done, tested, ready to go. How do you merge it back into the main project? Bring it into the fold. That's the job of git merge. First, you need to be on the branch you want to merge into. So typically you get checkout main. Get onto the main branch first. Right. Then you run git merge your feature branch. Git then takes the history and changes from your feature branch and weaves them into the main branch's history. It'll try to do this automatically. But if you and someone else change the exact same lines of code in the same file on different branches, mm -hmm. well, that's when you get a merge conflict. Ah, yes, the infamous merge conflict. Fun times, we'll get to yeah. that. But sometimes, especially if a feature takes a while, the main branch keeps evolving, right? Other people are merging their stuff in. Mm. You might need to pull those main updates into your feature branch to stay current. How's that done? Yeah, that's a really common and important workflow. It keeps your branch from diverging too much. The usual pattern is, first, Git checkout main. Back to main. Then git pull to make sure your local main has all the latest updates from the remote. Mm -hmm. Then git check out your feature branch to switch back to your work. And finally, git merge main. This brings those fresh changes from main into your feature branch. It makes the final merge back to main later on much, much smoother. Okay, that makes sense. Keep your branch updated along the way. So once your branch is ready, maybe you've merged main into it. It's all good. You need to send that branch up to the remote server so others can see it, review it, maybe test it. Exactly. To push a branch that doesn't exist on the remote yet, or just to push new commits on your branch, you use git push u origin branch name. What's the elfie? Ah, it is super helpful. It stands for setup stream. It tells git to link your local branch with the remote branch. Once you do that the first time you push a branch, future pushes and pulls for that branch often just need git push or git pull. Git remembers the connection. Nice. Simplifies things later. Uh -huh. Okay, let's shift gears a bit. Let's be honest. We all make mistakes. And Git is actually amazing at helping fix them, which is a huge relief. So what if you just made a commit like seconds ago and you instantly realize, oops, I messed up or I forgot to add that file? Right. Happens all the time. Git definitely saves the day here. If you want to undo the last commit but keep the changes you made, like keep them in your files so you can fix them and recommit, mm -hmm. you can use git reset head one. The head one means one commit before the current head. So it rewinds the commit history by one step but leaves the file changes. Exactly. But it's really important to distinguish that from git revert. If you need to undo the changes from a specific, perhaps older commit, especially one that's already been shared with others, you use git revert commit ash. The huge difference is reset, like head one. 
rewrites history. It removes the commit. It's usually okay if you haven't pushed it yet, but dangerous if others have that commit. Revert, on the other hand, creates a new commit that does the exact opposite of the commit you're reverting. It undoes the changes safely without rewriting shared history. Okay, that reset versus revert distinction is critical for teamwork. Got it. Now, what if it's smaller? Like, you just type the wrong thing in your last commit message uh -huh. or forgot one tiny file. You don't want a whole new undo commit just for that. No, definitely not. For fixing up that very last commit, you use git commit amend. This command lets you modify the most recent commit. You can change the message, add files you forgot, just get add them first, then run commit amend, make small code tweaks. It bundles those changes into the existing last commit instead of creating a new one. Super useful for keeping history clean. Can you even change the author with it? Yep, amend author, new name email at example.com. But the big caution applies again. Amend rewrites that last commit. If you've already pushed that commit, amending it locally and then trying to push again can cause major headaches for anyone who already pulled the original version. They'll have a different history. Right. Rewriting history is powerful, but needs care on shared stuff. Huh. Okay. What about just throwing away uncommitted changes? You're experimenting in a file. It didn't work out. You just want to go back to how it was when you last committed. Easy peasy. Yeah. To discard all uncommitted changes in a specific file, yeah. bringing it back to the version in the last commit, you use git checkout file name. The counts it is important. It tells git you mean the file, not a branch name. It's like a localized undo for uncommitted work in that file. Okay. Now, the one everyone dreads a little, merge conflicts. Two people change the same line. Git throws its hands up and says, you need to sort this out. How do you approach that? Hey, yeah, merge conflicts, a rite of passage. When Git detects a conflict during a merge, it stops and marks the conflicting areas right there in the file. You'll see those viz markers. Your job is to manually edit that file, look at the changes above the yours or the branch you're merging into, and below it, the changes from the other branch, decide what the correct combined version should be and delete those marker lines. And sometimes a tool can help. Yes. Often Git Merge Tool can launch a visual side-by-side -side comparison tool that makes it easier to see the differences and choose how to combine them. Once you've edited the file and resolved the conflict, you get add the fixed file and they get commit to finalize the merge. All right. Scenario time. You're deep in coding a new feature. You've got lots of changes, but nothing's quite ready to commit. Suddenly, urgent bug! You need to switch branches now. But what about your unfinished work? You don't want to commit it half done. Perfect use case for git stash. You just type git stash. Git takes all your uncommitted changes, both stage and unstage modifications, and saves them away temporarily on a sort of hidden shelf. It then cleans your working directory back to the last commit state. So your work is safe, but out of the way. Exactly. Your working directory is clean. You can safely switch branches, fix that urgent bug, commit it, push it, whatever. Then when you're ready to go back to your feature, you switch back to your feature branch and type git stash pop. Git reapplies those changes you stashed earlier. It's like hitting pause on your current work. That's incredibly useful, git stash. Okay, moving into slightly more advanced territory now. What if you don't want to merge a whole branch, but you just want one specific change, one single commit from another branch? Ah, for that you want git cherry pick commit dash. You find the unique hash, that long string of letters and numbers of the commit you want, and cherry pick applies the changes from just that commit onto your current branch. It creates a new commit on your branch, replicating those specific changes. Very handy for grabbing just a bug fix or a small utility function without merging everything else. Cherry picking. Got it. Okay, rebase. This one often sounds intimidating, powerful, maybe confusing. What's the main idea behind rebasing and why use it instead of merge? Rebasing is fundamentally about creating a cleaner, more linear project history. Imagine you branched off main a while ago, made some commits, and meanwhile main has also had new commits added. If you get merge main into your branch, you get a merge commit showing where the two histories came together. If you instead get rebase main, Git takes your commits, temporarily sets them aside, updates your branch to the latest state of main, and then reapplies your commits one by one on top of that new base. So it looks like you started your work from the latest version of main. Exactly. It rewrites your branch's history to make it a straight line, as if your work always followed the latest main branch updates without the extra merge commit cluttering things up. It's often preferred for feature branches before merging them back to keep the main history clean. And this interactive rebase thing? That sounds even more powerful for cleaning things up. Oh yeah. Interactive rebase, git rebase twice, is like unlocking Git's history editing suite. You usually start at like git rebase I had three to work on the last three commits, for example. 
Git then opens an editor showing those commits. You can reorder them. Squash multiple commits into a single one. Great for combining small work and progress commits. Reword commit messages. Even edit a commit to make changes. Or just delete commits entirely. So you could fix a typo in a message from three commits ago? Yep, using reword. Or take five messy commits and squash them into one perfect commit describing the feature. It's incredibly powerful for crafting a clean, understandable history before you share your branch. But again, the big warning. Because Rebase rewrites history. Don't do it on shared branches unless you really know what you're doing and coordinate with your team. Precisely. It can cause major synchronization problems if people have based their work on the history you're about to rewrite. Use it freely on your local branches before pushing, but be very careful afterwards. Understood. Powerful tool. Handle with care. Okay, sometimes you just need to play detective, see what changed, who changed it, find something specific. Git must have tools for that. Absolutely. Git log is your main window into the past. It shows the commit history, who, when, the commit message. Tons of options to format it, too. To see the actual changes in a file since the last commit, or between commits or branches, you use git diff. Git diff file shows unstaged changes. Git diff commit onecom commit two shows changes between two points in history. And finding out who changed a specific line. That's git blame file. It annotates every line in the file with the commit hash and author who last modified that line. Great for understanding context or tracking down where a bug might have been introduced. There's also git grep for searching inside the files across history for specific text. Lots of tools for digging in. Very cool. Two quick but essential housekeeping things. Telling Git to ignore certain files like logs or build outputs and properly removing files. Right. For ignoring files, you create a file named .gitting, starts with a dot, in your project's main directory. Inside that file, you list file names or patterns, like .log or build, that Git should completely ignore. It won't track them or even show them as untracked. For removing a file from the project, use git arm file. This command does two things. It deletes the file from your working directory and stages that deletion for the next commit. What if you want to stop tracking a file but keep it locally? Like, you accidentally committed a config file with secrets. Ah, good point. For that, you use git arm cached file. This removes the file from git's tracking, stages the removal, but leaves the actual file untouched on your disk. Then you'd usually add it to .git ignore so it doesn't get added back accidentally. Okay, nearly there. Last couple. Those times, you really need to force things. Maybe overwrite a remote branch because your local one is correct after a reset or rebase. Or just cleaning up clutter. Right, the force push. If you've rewritten history locally, like with rebase or reset, and need the remote branch to exactly match your local one, you might use git push origin branch name force or force with lease, which is a bit safer. But this needs a huge warning label. Force overwrites the remote branch history. If anyone else pushed changes you don't have, their work can be lost. It's a use only when absolutely necessary and communicate clearly with your team command. Seriously dangerous if misused. Very. And for cleaning up untracked files locally, maybe leftover build artifacts or test files you don't need, you can use git clean dash f. The dash f means force. It deletes untracked files from your working directory. Be mm -hmm. careful with that one too. Make sure you don't accidentally delete something important. Dash n does a dry run first. Wow. Okay, we covered a ton of ground there, really digging into those Git use cases from Relieve Moose's document. From the basics like clone, add, commit, push, pull, all the way through branching, merging, fixing mistakes with reset, revert, amend, and even the advanced stuff like rebase and cherry pick, it really shows how versatile Git is. It might seem like a lot, but as you said, it becomes more intuitive right. with practice, especially when you connect the command to the why, the specific situation you're trying to handle. It really does. And the core value, that powerful version control, just extends so far beyond code, doesn't it? It's about having that history, collaborating effectively, that safety net for any project where things change. You know, it makes you think, how could these Git principles, tracking changes meticulously, using branches for new ideas or fixes, merging things back carefully, how could that framework apply elsewhere? Not just software, but managing complex documents, design work, maybe even planning personal projects. Yeah. Where else could that idea of a, a commit or a branch give you that safety or that space to innovate, something to ponder, 